I'll keep going. But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. Anybody know? Malachi. Malachi, very good. And you will tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day which I am preparing, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, even the statutes and ordinances which I have commanded him in Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord, and he will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the land with a curse. And so ends the Old Testament. It's quite a, it's just a rousing ending. So I just, I don't know, I thought it would be an interesting way to start our day. Um, two announcements before we get going. So we're going to have Sunday school first and then memorial service, in case you didn't know. And one big announcement, we're missing a purse. We're missing a gold leather purse somewhere in this area. If you guys can look around, like everywhere. Anybody see one from yesterday? It was left here from uh, when we went on the buses. It has not been seen since. Gold leather purse, small? Yes? All right, you is missing a blanket. What kind of blanket? Big one. Big one. <laughs> Blue. Blue. <laughs> there it is. It's right here. All right, no gold purse, though. No purse? No gold purse. All right. Well, I don't know what we'll do. Um, second of all, as far as for memorial service, we're a big group, so if you could, in between the break, come and give me announcements or prayers for others, just to keep things a little more organized. And with that, I think we're ready to start. We'll sing a hymn, we'll have a prayer, and then we'll dismiss all the little ones. And we're going to start with one I hope you know. It's number 200 in Praise the Lord book, which is It's Me, It's Me, O Lord. It's number 200 in the Praise the Lord book. God and our Heavenly Father, we come before you now. Thank you for the new day you have given us. You have brought us safely through the night and now united us together here in this room with our many friends and brothers and sisters and young people. We pray that what we would do this day would honor you and glorify your name, help each one of us to grow and to walk more perfectly in thy sight and to be on that narrow path which leads to thy kingdom. We pray that we may look only on your Son, our Lord, as an example of one to follow. And we pray that we would always seek to do thy will. Be with each one of us today and 
enlighten our hearts so that your words will seep into them and that they may become part of our lives and help each one of us to grow. We pray and give you thanks for those many things you give us each and every day now. We thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Try it, Mike Vanna. For Sunday school, everybody uh, in high school and up will remain in here and will hear the uh, presentation by Brother Chris. Everybody else will, we have classes for you in the back. So we'll just dismiss you by classes. Also, I'm going to need help babysitting. Um, so does anybody want to volunteer to help babysit uh, this morning? Sarah will. Okay, that's good. That'll, that will be good. I think we'll have a few uh, to babysit for. So why don't we dismiss the various classes? Uh, we'll start with the middle school or junior high. That will be Sister Abigail. So uh, anybody that's in uh, grade well, middle school, ages 11 to 14 or so, Ross? go with Abigail. Yes. two grade school classes, so the upper grade school class is uh, Matthew, and Matthew, why don't you take everybody that's in your class. What grades? Um, third and third grade and up. Children for babysitting, and then we'll take those. They're probably already in the back. Babysitters can, can go Lord. next. It's not gold. All right, Beth, can you show the babysitters? Right. Yeah, show the babysitters. They're already back here. Okay, thank you, Dan. All right, a little crowd control there. That's good. Hey, all you folks in the back, if you want to come on up, there's some seats now. Really. Come on, Jen. A little bit. Jen, that means you. Okay. Well, we did it. We did find the purse, so that's a success. Very good. All right. So our Sunday school class 
We're going to have a reading before we start, which is from Luke 16. Luke 16. We're going to read verse 19 through 32. Luke 16, 19 through 31. <laughs> Depends which version you have, I guess. All right, Luke 16, starting at verse 19. Now there was a certain rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, gaily living in splendor every day. And a certain poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gates covered with sores. And longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table, besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Now it came about that when the poor man died, he was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in the water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus bad things. But now he is being comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great chasm fixed, in order that those who wish to come over from here to you may not be able, and that none may cross over from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, that you may send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, lest they also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. But he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. And so that proved to be true, didn't it? So our exhortation, our, our uh, Sunday school talk, sorry, uh, is going to be on the rich man Lazarus, and look forward to Brother Chris. Thanks, Brother Dan. Good morning, Good morning everyone. Good morning. Well, I hope you got your thinking caps on, and uh, I hope that uh, you, you're, you're willing to work through this, this parable with me. Um, you know, we were looking at some, some challenging parables yesterday. Uh, perhaps this is one uh, that you've, you've found um, perhaps particularly challenging. Uh, we're going to try this to make this um, a bit more interactive because it's Sunday school, so hopefully uh, you'll be engaged in it. Uh, we may not get through everything, but uh, hopefully we'll lay a bit of a groundwork. My goal would be, I think there's some exhortation here without a doubt. Uh, my goal would also be, though, that you're, you're not... Um, sort of threatened by this parable, or kind of like, oh, I hope if I'm talking to a, a friend that maybe believes in, in uh, the sort of traditional view of, of heaven and hell, that they don't come here because I don't know what to say. I'm hoping that you'll have some confidence to see not only what this parable isn't, is not teaching, but what it is about. I think that's important in all our first principles. I mean, it's one thing to be able to have an, an answer, uh, but it's also very good to uh, be able to explain and uh, have a positive teaching for some of these challenging, uh, challenging verses. So right off the bat, uh, I, I would say you need to sort of step back and say, what's the big picture? You know, what's, what is the parable about primarily? And I would, I would sort of pick out these two things. Uh, first and foremost, you, ha you only have this life to get it right, to get right with God. Don't expect any second chances. In, in his mercy and his blessing, there may be opportunities in our life. We mentioned yesterday, you know, through, through trials and challenges in our life that uh, we have an opportunity to kind of redirect our lives if we're kind of going off course. Um, but like when death comes, that's it. That's a, there's a finality in death, and there's no second chances after that. Um, and, and this one, perhaps even more so, and uh, uh, Dan alluded to the fact that that's how the parable ends. Uh, if you are not moved by the power of God's word, then no miracle will have any effect on you. You know, sometimes we sort of think, oh, you know, if I lived in the Old Testament, you know, when they were receiving visions and talked to God directly, or, you know, imagine living in the first century and Jesus was there and was doing all these things. Well, you know, then it would be so much easier to believe. This parable tells you, no, it doesn't work that way. If you're not moved by the power of God's word 
and we have a miracle sitting right in our laps here. We have God speaking to us through his word. Um, that is, is all and sufficient for salvation. And, uh, you know, sort of don't pine away and wish this and wish that uh, in terms of seeing God directly in our lives. So just sort of setting the stage, we're going to end with those two points as well, and hopefully they'll maybe um, uh, have even more meaning for you then. All right, the other thing I'd like to do is uh, just have a look at this graphic here. Um, this is, this is a, a graphic I picked off the internet that um, would be what we might call the traditional concept of, of, of heaven and hell. And even this one's got some stuff in it that they've been, you can see they've got sort of the rich man uh, down here and Lazarus here. So they've even tried to modify even the traditional view of heaven and hell um, to fit this parable. And my suggestion is going to be that that's not even supported. So I'm assuming that most of you, because it's in the media from when we were a young age, even if you were raised in Christadelphia, you are aware of, of you know, the Christian view of, of heaven and hell. And it is pervasive inside. Even people that don't read their Bibles or don't even go to church would have this concept of heaven and hell. All right? So what, we're going to brainstorm for a little bit. Uh, and you know, we'll take this view here. Many uh, would have, it would start, stop here for many people. You know, when you die, you either go to paradise or, or heaven um, or hell. And they wouldn't even really worry much about resurrection and judgment. So you can see that in this, in this um, view here, and I forget which website I picked this off, they've got this sort of temporary holding thing, which is, you know, uh, paradise and Tartarus or whatever, and, and heaven and hell come later here. So even this one, you see, they've tried to, take, they've tried to make their view uh, kind of work with this parable. So just having read, reading through this, so like, and this is where a little bit of audience participation, what do we read here or don't read here in this parable that right away you don't need to be challenged by this parable because it doesn't even teach what they think it should teach, if, if you get my drift. I don't want to give too much away. So who wants to get us started? What's either here in the parable or not here in the parable for which you could, if you were to teach talking to someone who and believes in the traditional view of heaven and hell would be inconsistent with what's here. Yep? Christ hasn't happened yet, yet these people are in heaven and hell. When, when, the, when the parable was, was spoken? Okay, so Christ hasn't even kind of made his sacrifice? Resurrection. The resurrection hasn't happened of, of Christ. Good. Yep. Okay, what about, sorry, spirit? Yep. So where's that in the parable? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, it's not there. Is there there's, there's no, okay, good. Well, there might be even more on that, but I, I don't want to say too much here. We'll let people, can, can you, yep? Well, I'm just going to say heaven is not mentioned, but Hades is, which is known as hell. Okay, so Hades is the grave. We could certainly show that in scripture. And heaven is not mentioned here. You know, it's, there's this concept of Abraham's bosom, which we're going to have to understand, but heaven is not mentioned. Excellent. So careful Bible reading. It's not what we teach our seminar students. Right? as they're learning to read the Bible effectively, read carefully what's actually there. Heaven's not mentioned here. There's nothing about a spirit. Okay? It appears to be that they can see each other, which of course would be inconsistent with traditional knowledge. Isn't that interesting? And you can see that the, 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 the people who did this diagram here have kind of struggled with that. They've got, okay, we've got this sort of place here where we're all actually together and can see each other. Well, if you're talking to someone who has more a traditional false Christian kind of view, the concept of being up in heaven and being in hell and being able to communicate is, is not in their, in their philosophy and in their, in their teaching. So that's a good one. Thank you. Um, yep, go ahead. Okay, so we could start going to some other scriptures to say, look, there's, there's a cessation of, of consciousness in death. They don't know anything. would be in Ecclesiastes and so on. That's great. Okay, let's, let's stick. We're just in Luke 16 for now, though, still. Okay. We've got fingers and tongues and obviously eyes, okay? It's not sort of a disembodied soul, which would be consistent with a, 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 a Christian traditional view. So yeah, like read what's there and ask that. I would say, okay, you explain to me how your idea of life after death fits with this parable. And it wouldn't take long before they'd go, oh, okay, that doesn't really fit. And so at some point, 
whatever they used to think or are currently believing doesn't fit with this. And then might, they might be open and hopefully they say, well, what do you think it means? And then you can talk, okay? So yeah, that's a great one. Physical body parts are obviously here and um, excellent. Okay, um, yeah, Dana? Okay. Excellent, excellent. And so that's uh, Hebrews 11. There's a number, a number of verses there, but it clearly says Abraham has not received the promise. You know, they have not received the promise. So whatever happened in this parable, you know, Abraham's not there yet. And the very end, the very last verse in Hebrews 11 is, is, fa is fundamental, right? We're all going to receive the reward simultaneously. So that's a good one to sort of, um, you know, branch off from here. Thanks for that. Yes? We're going to talk about Abraham. I've got to, it's coming up in a bit, so hang on to that thought because we're going to look at the question of, you know, it's interesting in their little picture here, they don't have David mentioned, but you could probably say to someone, so David would probably be here, right? And then you could go to the passage in, in Acts, you know, where he's not in heaven, is, is, he's buried right over there. Okay, so that, that's a good one. Okay, yep, yeah, this is great. Yes. Yes. Excellent. So Luke 16 as a whole, we looked yesterday at the, the, the parable of the unjust judge, and that was about judgment. And, and I, so that's why I kind of said this is sort of the judgment day part two, the, these two, these two parables. So yeah, step back and have a look at the big context. Um, good. Yes. Well, that's interesting. Um, yeah, oh, and, and Sadducees as well. We'll talk about them. Um, I've got that come up here. And, and the Sadducees didn't believe in an afterlife and so on. So yeah, there's, he's challenging the, the, you know, the beliefs in those days as well as projecting into the future. Okay, yes? No mention of the devil. Thank you. Great point. Okay, there's some, some torment going on in, in the, the mind of, of the rich man. But yeah, th there's some key players missing. Okay, so I think you need just to kind of, it's, it's really an effective Bible reading. You can help people through this. And let's, let's just read what's there. And if you have some preconceived ideas, even those preconceived ideas don't fit. So let's turn that around and let's read what's there and, you know, uh, find out what we're supposed to believe about these things from what we read, not project our ideas onto there. Um, but even some of those ideas uh, don't fit with what's here. So don't be afraid of this passage. It's challenging, yes. But I think, I don't know if, 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 you're, like, if you're like me, but sometimes it's even hard to read these things, even with these false ideas kind of in my head, even though I don't believe them. They still kind of, you know, you read with, with, without kind of a fresh view. So sometimes just step back and read it. The other interesting thing is they've tried to work in resurrection and judgment here. Now, these, these people seem to know their Bible at some point. So most people that you're talking about, it would go straight from, you know, this would be heaven and hell right here, more like this picture at the end. But even with this picture, okay, and they've got resurrection and they've got judgment, we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Still, how does that work? Because at the end of this parable, is there any hope for the rich man? There's not. So, I mean, if he's here, he's going to there. So... Why have resurrection and judgment? Like seriously, ask people that question. Like what would be the purpose of raising this person and judging him? Isn't he already kind of judged? The decision was made at death in the traditional view. Like you go one way or the other. And that is so inconsistent with scripture. And that would just kind of lead into so many great conversations about resurrection. I mean, resurrection, you go to 1 Corinthians 15, you know, without the res resurrection of Christ and without the hope of resurrection, we have no hope. No one does. 
So resurrection is fundamental, and the concept of, of a judgment, that the decision is made, and then, well, we would see this as the kingdom, right? The kingdom of God on earth, or a returning to the grave. All right, and that's what we'll come to. So it's just interesting. I, I found that kind of interesting to see how they would handle a parable like this um, and uh, how it's inconsistent with so many things in Scripture, but also inconsistent even with their own so-called view of things. All right, that's great. I'd love to have more discussion, but we should just kind of move on. Hopefully, just even with that, even those of you who didn't participate, you can kind of say, look, I don't have to be intimidated by this passage. I can come here, we can read it, and sort to sort through things. And hopefully at some point the person would say, well, you know what, maybe that's not saying what I thought it's always said, so let's try and figure out what it is saying. And, and, and that would be uh, a, a great uh, step forward, would it not? All right, so a little bit of context um, for the parable. Um, we finished off yesterday with the unjust judge looking at verse 13, that at the end of the day you can't serve God and mammon. All right, and, and see if the people in Jesus' day, whether that hit home to them. Like, did they get the point? And I think they did. I would suggest you, we mentioned yesterday that the uh, parable of the unjust judge is an elaboration of the older brother from Luke 15, who was in the house the whole time and yet wasting his, his master's goods. And if you have a look at verse 14 then of, of Luke 16, the Pharisees also who were covetous heard all these things and they derided him. Did the point hit home? They got it. The Pharisees would have been the, the typical older brethren from the previous, previous parable. They were in the house. They had all the outward appearance. Okay, it looked like they were doing everything God had told them, and yet they, they were not uh, manifesting God's character. All right? They, I would suggest to you, are the rich man in this next parable. So they're deriding him, and Jesus almost, you can kind of see him saying, you know, you thought you were the unjust judge. I'm going to ramp this up a little bit. And in the next parable, it's going to hit home even more. They are the rich man. And, and we'll, we'll see that. Um, where am I? There we go. <clears throat> All right. And then, um, so verse 15, this was his response. Now, they're, they're in their mind, they're covetous, and they're, they're deriding him, whether that was external, how that happened. Of course, even if they were only thinking in their head, Jesus would have knew, known that. So look what he says in verse 15. He said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. And that's the point that was made here earlier. That's, that's the, 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 the lead into this parable. Jesus is going to show them that things you highly esteem, riches, honor, social status, all that kind of stuff, means nothing to God. Okay? You highly esteem them, God doesn't. And, it, and it's, it's, uh, when we were going through Luke with our um, uh, Bible reading group, after the, the first few weeks, we, um, you know, we went, went through Genesis. And then our, our second time around, the, the following, it was maybe a couple of years later, we did Luke. And we had one uh, man who came out uh, regularly, and he said, oh, Luke is filled with these reversals. You know, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. And, and, just, it's, it's, and once he said that, I was like, wow, it's there a lot. So, and this is one of those. Man highly esteems it. God despises it. Things that, that the world despises and sees no value in, those are the things that, that God actually esteems. So it's one of these um, reversals. And... Um, I think I have another passage here. There we go. Yeah, there it is there. Matthew 20, 16. The last shall be first, and the first shall be last. Many are called, few are chosen. Now, really, it's a matter of, of perspective, this reversal. Um, it's, it's, you know, seeing the invisible. It's, it's uh, seeing the future, the things that are, are eternal, as opposed to the things that are temporal in the here and now. Just flip back a few pages uh, to Luke 13. And someone was mentioning... Um, about sort of Abraham, where, where is it, what, what's up with Abraham. And I think this is a key passage, because we're going to come to Abraham's uh, bosom in a moment. Uh, this is at the, uh, the, the, in Luke uh, 13 here. Um, let's just pick it up in verse 28. Um, well, we'll back it up a little bit. It talks about the, uh, the, the striving, verse 24, striving under the straight gate. Uh, many shall tr strive to enter therein, but shall not be able to find it. Uh, he's going to shut the door. Some will knock, verse, verse 25 there, and they're going to knock and say, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he'll say, I don't know you. 
Okay, which is which is really tragic when you think about it. How could someone think they had a relationship with Christ or with God? And he says, I don't even know you. And, and that's the reason, because they the, the reason is they didn't really ever know him, really. They thought they did, but they didn't. And and they're they're they continue to knock and they say, Look, but we've we've eaten and drunk in your presence. You you've taught in our streets. And he'll say, I, uh, he'll, verse 27, I tell you, I know you not, whence you are, depart from me, all you workers of iniquity, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is a judgment picture. When someone is completely rejected, this is sort of, this is the final judgment. And just as a little aside, that'd be a great little study, weeping and gnashing of teeth. And I think you'll find it's always associated with rejection at the judgment seat. And what I think is that the parable of rich men and Lazarus is an elaboration of that. Why will they weep in their gnash and gnash their teeth? What, what, will, what will they be thinking? How, how, what would that experience be like to be weeping and gnashing of teeth, knowing that there is no more hope for you? I believe that, that from Luke 13 here, by the time we get to Luke 16, Jesus is elaborating on that concept. The, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus is all about what happens after you're put on the right hand or the left of the Lord. All right? So here's, here it's, it's called it, uh, the weeping and gnashing of teeth. And look what it says. You shall see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and yourselves thrust out. This is Abraham's bosom. Because that's where Abraham's going to be, inheriting the land in the kingdom. And all those faithful ones, all his heirs, Right? Because when we're baptized into Christ, we put on Christ to become heirs to the promises to Abraham. So we're with Abraham in his bosom, as it were, in the kingdom. There'll be other people thrust out. Some who thought they were Abraham's seed, like the ones that uh, Jesus was speaking to at the time. Do you remember the, do you remember the little sort of uh, confrontation that went on between Jesus and the Pharisees? They said, well, we're Abraham's children. And he's like, uh, no. If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. It's not, about, it's not a blood lineage. It's about those who act like Abraham. And you don't because you're trying to kill me. Right? And they said, well, you know, we know where we're from. From you, we're not sure where you came from. You know, who is your father, by the way? Is that kind of like that like dig they got in at Jesus? All right? So here, those in Abraham's bosom are with Abraham in the kingdom. The rest are thrust out. And they shall come from the east, from the west, from the north, and from the south, and shall sit down in the kingdom of God, and behold, there, and behold, there are last which shall be first, i.e., this poor beggar in the parable, and there are first in the eyes of men, like Pharisees, who are going to be last and thrust out. And um, you can see that in the very next one, the Pharisees come and say, get out of here, you know, you're going to get killed, right? So... This is the controversy that's going on, and, and I think that's what Luke um, 16 is all about. So that's an excellent passage. Where is Abraham, and what does it mean to be in Abraham's bosom? It means in the kingdom with Abraham, and you just put together a couple of passages, and that's key. Um, all righty, so rich men, the rich man here in the parable then, verse, starts in verse 19. Uh, and a certain rich man was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptu sumptuously every day. In Jesus' day, that was the Pharisee class and the Sadducean class. They were wealthy, they were well-respected, they walked the street, people got out of their way and, you know, kind of dipped their hat to them. Um, you know, this is, this is uh, that class of people. We can decide maybe later what the correspondence to is today. Uh, I think we could probably see a few things. We could probably e easily see it in some of the, the false religions of the day who fare sumptuously which is fine, but maybe we need to look at ourselves as well at times. Comment? You know, wasn't the idea that they would be seen? Absolutely. Okay. And yet, Lazarus was at the gate of the rich man's house, but he wasn't seen. He was completely unseen. Excellent point. Until, but in God's sight, he was seen because it said so. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's, an, that's, the, that's the key point, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, you didn't see me because you stepped right over me on the way out to your next, you know, social engagement. Yeah, exactly. Excellent point. So there's the rich man. Uh, when we look at um, uh, Lazarus, 
in verse 20, there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate, right in front of him, laid at his gate, full of sores, desiring to be fed with crumbs which fell from the, the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So let's talk a little bit about Lazarus. Um, Lazarus is a Greek word. Um, Eliezer is the Hebrew equivalent. Uh, literally means El, El, or God, surrounds, protects, and helps. So there was no one else helping this guy from the sort of a religious establishment, should we say. Uh, they weren't caring for him anyway. What, what do we maybe learn from, the, um, from some of the things we're told about Lazarus here? Um, there's some clues here. He's desiring to be fed with crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Any echoes there? That's a big one. Okay, we've got some heads on. What are, what are echoes to? Crumbs which fall from a table? Yes, Syrophoenician woman, okay, a Gentile. And uh, it's probably there in your margin if you want to make a note of it. Uh, Matthew 15, 27. I've got it highlighted in my margin. If it's not, write it in, Matthew 15, 27. And she said, yea, Lord, but even the dogs will eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. So you've got two things connected there. There's dogs in this picture and there's crumbs. So what Jesus commended the woman for that. Why did he commend her? What was it about this woman's attitude? In fact, did he not say, I've not seen faith like this in Israel? Okay, so her faith. What about her faith? She believed that he could heal her, da her daughter, right? Um, so there's faith involved. There's, what, what other characteristics? And she's sticking with him. Yep. Yeah, and she's not put off by what could have been taken as a quite of a, a slight against her. She just acknowledges, yes, I, I am a nobody. You're right, so help me. <laughs> okay, so there's some, some humility, trust. There's, there's a, she's not a Jew, so she's not trusting in, in that sort of thing. She's a, she knows that there's that Israel's God is the God. So she's come in faith to Israel's God as a Gentile, as opposed to many of the Jews who just kind of took it for granted. And I think we need to be careful about that. You know, sometimes some of us have inherited the truth because in, in we grew up in a, in a Christophian home or whatever. You've got to make it your own. You've got to, you know, you, you can't just kind of trust in, in bloodlines or family names or that kind of thing, right? Here, this Lazarus, the indication that, well, we don't know in the parable whether he was Jew or Gentile, but he's with dogs, which there's a connection there to, um, to the Gentile nations. And he's eating crumbs. He's a beggar, okay? But he's trying to, well, he's connected himself to the, the God of Israel because he's taken to Abraham's bosom, all right? So there's, there's lots going on here. I forget what else I have on this slide. Um, this one, this is the passage. And I, this is what was referred to here where he was seen but not seen. Look at this one. This might be worth um, writing in your margin. Matthew 23. So the rich man is, is symbolizing the, the Sadducean, uh, Pharisee, religious organization of the day. And the, the Lazarus is the poor man who's being overlooked by them. Look at this passage, Matthew 23, 13. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for ye neither go in yourselves, neither ye neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. They, they were doing nothing to help this man. They weren't reaching out to him in any way. Do you remember the, uh, when Jesus, it's probably that same passage, when he says to them, well, do all that they say, but don't do as they do, all right? And he says, they won't even lift a finger to, to you know, they, they lay heavy burdens on other people, but they don't even lift them with one of their fingers. Well, fingers came in prominent into this parable. There's all of these little echoes uh, that are connecting to Christ's experience with the organized religion of the day. Um, I just have written here, the organized religion of the day was actually hindering people from coming to God. That was the rich man. Um, and I would suggest to you it's also true today that the brand of, of, of uh, Christendom, Christianity, that is sort of popular actually hinders people from, from seeing the truth for, whatever, for various many, for many various reasons. Sometimes you hear someone rant against you know, religion and all the things that they're hitting on, we would probably agree with. Right? In terms of uh, you know, the structure of it and the opulence of it, you know, the, the, the fighting, whatever, whatever goes on. Um, but that's not, that's not true Christianity. That's not the Christ of the Bible. And somehow, hopefully, people get past that. 
It was certainly true in, in Christ's day. The, the people that should have been leading uh, all the people to, to God and ultimately to Christ were actually the ones hindering it and, and opposing it at every step of the way. How, how many wars were actually Christians fighting Christians? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's tragic, this, this concept that, yeah, we're going to force things upon people. And it, it's not Christ's way. Absolutely true. Um, and, and I guess let's see that in all of, you know, Christendom that's out there. And, and, and that's fine. But, you know, can we do that sometimes? Even in Christadelphia, can we in our own way, actually hinder people from coming to the truth? Do we set up roadblocks? Do we have stumbling blocks in front of people? And, and, and as opposed to just letting the word have its power and letting Christ work through those circumstances to bring them to himself. It, you know, that's, that's what, and, and I'm just, I'm worried that in my own personal life and in, in, in the way we operate sometimes, we actually, this verse can apply to us. So let's not just see it in others. Let's, let's reflect upon ourselves. Yes? That's a very good point. Yeah, the, the rich were good in our estimation, and the poor was bad in our estimation, and God was seeing it totally the other way around. That, that's a great point. So what we consider good, or you know, we must be being blessed by God because look what's happening to us, may or may not be the case. Yeah, that, that's, that's an excellent point. All right, we should keep going. So what happens? Verse 22. This is the big reversal. Here, here's the reversal. The first shall be last, and the last shall be first. It came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. <clears throat> so this is the, the reversal. Um, it's explained in verse 25 when Abraham in the parable is speaking to the man. Son, remember that you in your lifetime received good things. You can also put that in quotes, right? Good things. And likewise, Lazarus, evil things. Uh, but now he is comforted and thou art tormented. Just keep a finger there. I don't, we're running a little bit out of time and some really important things I want to get to. Flip back to uh, quickly to, to Luke 6. And I was going to read a, a fairly long section here. Um, it is the, the Beatitude section. Um, the blessed section, Luke does some things that the other gospel writers don't, and I think help to explain this sort of reversal idea, the then and the now. It's all you know, temporal versus eternal, the here and now versus the future. Okay, So just pick it up in um, verse 20. He lifted up his eyes to his disciples and said, this is Luke 6, verse 20, Blessed be the poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. So you're familiar, this is the, the Beatitude section. But look at this, blessed are ye that hunger now... For ye shall be filled. Blessed are you that weep now, for you shall laugh. Right? So, yeah, you're going to have some struggles. People may look at you and say, oh, you're a poor beggar by the sideline just eating crumbs. But that's okay. You're okay with that. Um, because it's the here and now. You don't care about those sort of things. You're looking to the future. And the reverse is also true. Um, look on verse, the other neat thing uh, Luke does is has the woes. Verse 25. Woe unto you that are full, for you shall hunger. Woe unto you that laugh now, for you shall weep. Then. <laughs> In the future. So the, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus fits right in here with Luke 6. It's all about the here and now versus the future. And the rich man had it good now, he thought, and Ab uh, Lazarus evil, but it reversed uh, the then uh, in the future. Okay, so we need to somehow still, so I think you see where I'm heading with this parable, is that I believe this is the, this is the judgment seat. Uh, sh the sheep and the goat are being separated, however you want to see that. You've got, because uh, we know there's nothing between death and resurrection. There's unconsciousness. You can go to all the passages in, in Ecclesiastes and elsewhere. You know, a man is at his honor and his understanding is not as the sheep, the, the, the sheep that perish. Um, however, you know, there, there's, there's a cessation of consciousness. 
So when the, the Lazarus is, um, is carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom, that would be he's been now been raised, he's been judged worthy, perhaps this gives some insight into the involvement of the angels, and they take him to the right-hand side. All right? And um, the, the, uh, the, the rich man was in hell or Hades, okay, but he's obviously also now been raised, and he's on the left-hand side, and there is the ability, there's, there's now consciousness. There's, I think what we're getting here is an elaboration of the weeping and gnashing of teeth. What will it be like to know at that moment when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the prophets, and maybe some people that you know, going into the kingdom with Abraham, in Abraham's bosom, and you yourself thrust out? That's what this is an elaboration of. If you want to make a note, I was going to go to Galatians chapter 3. That's the key passage, Galatians 3, 26 to 29, that those that are baptized into Christ are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So you want to do some good Bible study with someone who now is saying, okay, maybe this parable isn't saying what I thought it said. So what is Abraham's bosom? Well, what is it scripturally defined? Where does Abraham appear in scripture? You can look at the promises to Abraham. And you go to, he was promised the land. He hasn't received it yet. He looked for something better. Hebrews says, we'll all inherit that together. Galatians 3 says that can be us. It's not a blood relationship. It, it's, a, it's a spiritual relationship. Those that do the works of Abraham are Abraham's children, and they're now with him. You can put all that together, and what a positive teaching that is. Uh, there's nothing you know, hard about that. It's just good scriptural, you know, comparing scripture with scripture and seeing that thread. So that's where Lazarus is. He's, he's with Abraham.